Pentecostal Church family. Once again, uh, we're going to continue with the series of lessons uh, that asks the question, how does God want us to treat each other? Uh, today, I want to talk about just being an encourager. Uh, I heard a story once about a 10-year-old boy who entered a uh, hotel coffee shop and sat at a table. The waitress came and brought a glass of water, put it in front of him, and he asked her, how much is an ice cream sundae? Three dollars and fifty cents, the waitress replied. The little boy pulled out a handful of coins and muddled through them, counting and studying them. And he looks up and he says, how much is just a plain dish of ice cream? Well, some people were starting to fall into the restaurant there and the waitress looked a little impatient and answered, two fifty, a little harshly. The young man again counted the coins and resigned to it, he says, I'll just have the plain ice cream. The waitress hurriedly brought out the ice cream and just dropped it on the table along with the bill and walked away. Young boy finished the ice cream, walked to the front of the restaurant, paid the cashier, and then walked out. The waitress finally came back around, began wiping the table down when she noticed on the table what made her swallow pretty hard. Placed neatly beside the empty dish of ice cream was four quarters, a dollar. He had left that for her as a tip. As parents, many of you know, just like I, we try to encourage our children in everything that we do and everything that they do. But just as this story illustrates, sometimes the children can encourage us adults. With this in mind today, we're going to look at Barnabas, one of the most renowned encouragers in our Bible, uh, and see what we can learn about encouraging one another. Our first point today is that we should encourage each other through our giving. Let's start in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37, and read that together. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. First, let's look at what all was happening during the early days of the church. Verse 32 says they were sharing all of their belongings with everyone. Verse 34 says there were none that had any need, and many of them would be bringing uh, the proceeds from any sale to the apostles for distribution among the church. Every need they had was filled. The fact that all of these Christians were involved in this encourages me greatly. Uh, what would our church look like? if all of us gave as much as we possibly could, not just of money, but time and effort. Also, one person in particular stuck out to the apostles. His real name, we find here, was Joseph, but that nickname that the apostles gave to him, the disciples there, called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Uh, that's how we know him best today. Have you ever been given a nickname? Uh, maybe it's because of something that you've done. Uh, is it anything like son of encouragement? Barnabas must have been a giver. He just must have been. Even though others may have given a lot, Barnabas was special. Uh, and we don't have any reason to believe that this was done for any selfish reasons. Uh, for some reason, though, his sale of his property and the gift to the church are worthy of a mention uh, to Luke here in the book of Acts. Something about Barnabas was special in what he gave. Our next point uh, can be found in Acts chapter 9. This is verses eight, 19 through 28. Saul begins his ministry 
for Jesus. Barnabas shows us how we should be willing to take some risks while encouraging others. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Knowing Saul and his former life didn't stop Barnabas from being the encourager. I am sure it took a lot of courage to stand up and defend a man with the kind of reputation that Saul had. I imagine there would be some friends and family of those who possibly Saul had persecuted, and they might be asking Barnabas, why would you stick your neck out for him? What kind of risk? would Barnabas have to take in order to bring Saul before the apostles? There would be no way Barnabas would know that this man, this murderer, would become the most prolific writer of the New Testament. Barnabas could not possibly understand how profound the vote of confidence that he had in Saul and how far that could go. To this day, the effects of that risk to be an encouragement and his willingness to take a risk on Saul can still be felt. And just like Barnabas, we never know what our encouragement may do. Luke doesn't go into any details on how Barnabas was so convinced in Saul's conversion, but we do know that he was willing to stand up for what was right when he was given that opportunity. We know that he saw the good in someone who might otherwise have been rejected. Can we not do the same? We can all be comforted in also knowing that we're given opportunities to take risks for God. We don't have to know the outcome first. We may take a chance on someone and risk being ridiculed by others, or even risk being betrayed by the one we're trying to encourage. No matter the outcome, we know that God is in control. That brings us to our third and final point today, we need to encourage others by committing. Let's look at Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. There are several things 
I'd like to look at here. First, the state of things surrounding the stoning of Stephen and the persecution of the church. I am sure during this time, it wasn't easy to stay faithful to God. So anyone who would be described in verse 24 as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, is someone we should pay special attention to. The church was scattered, just as Jack mentioned that we are during this time of uh, quarantine. Barnabas was someone the elders of the church in Jerusalem could trust to send in order to encourage those that were being converted in Antioch. Barnabas's commitment to the spreading of the gospel was more than enough to overcome any obstacles that he would encounter. He also travels some 150 miles in order to find Saul, a commitment to go out of his way to encourage Saul by bringing him along on this mission trip. A commitment to a man that he believed in, even after he had been sent away to Tarsus. Barnabas did not give up on Saul. Barnabas and Saul committed to teaching and preaching in Antioch for an entire year. That commitment resulted in verse 26, where it says they taught a great many people. And back in verse 24, a great many people were added to the Lord. Without all of these commitments, there would be no growth in the kingdom. Any amount of selfishness, any fear of risk, any lack of commitment when it comes to working in God's kingdom can keep us from becoming what God wants us to be, what God needs us to be. Barnabas didn't seem to be too afraid of the consequences of his actions. He trusted in God and the outcome took care of itself. When we focus on encouraging others by giving all that we can, not being afraid to take a chance on someone and commit to encourage that person, no matter what, we can be like Barnabas and watch the church grow. So what does that look like? What would that look like? I've told this story once before, but I'll use it again. I love it. I think it's the perfect example of what encouraging people looks like in our world today. An older lady went to the same post office in her town because the postal employees were so friendly. She went there to buy stamps just before Christmas one year, and the lines were incredibly long. Another customer leaned over and said, I know you just need to buy stamps and, and there's a machine in the lobby that will sell those to you. The lady says, I know, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and encouraged them to display that same kind of care for one another. In 1 Corinthians 12, 25 and 26, we'll close with these words. That there be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. God bless you.